In part nine, we discovered that the two great lights of the sun and moon typify the glory of the light of the two covenants, old and new. The sign of these covenants is the blood, first typified by Abel's blood, whose voice cried out to God for Cain, not against him. When Paul spoke of the heavenly bodies of the sun and moon and their glory, he followed with, so is it with the resurrection of the dead. The fact that the light of the sun and moon typify the glory of the two covenants suggests to us that the purpose of these covenants from their beginning has always been the resurrection of the dead. This makes perfect sense when we recognize that resurrection is the principle of sowing and reaping and sowing and reaping correlate perfectly with the two covenants. Consider the following from the concordant literal New Testament. Thus also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption. It is roused in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor. It is roused in glory. It is sown in infirmity. It is roused in power. It is sown a soulish body. It is roused a spiritual body. If there is a soulish body, there is a spiritual also. Thus, it is written also, the first man, Adam, became a living soul. The last Adam, a vivifying spirit. But not first the spiritual, but the soulish, thereupon the spiritual. Our word sown is defined by Strong's as to scatter, that is, so, literal or figurative. See also 1 Corinthians 15, 35 through 38. Our word raised is quite interesting, defined as to waken or rouse, literally from sleep, from sitting or lying, from disease, from death, or figurative from obscurity, inactivity, ruins, non-existence. And our word, resurrection, it means a standing up again. There is a soulish body. There is a spiritual also. No wonder Jesus stated, what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? The fact that our word raised means to waken from sleep leads to the following. And the Lord God said, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh in its place. Then the rib which the Lord God had taken from man, he made into a woman and he brought her to the man. Why was it not good for the man to be alone? Might it be because the principle of sowing and reaping requires male and female? Furthermore, we read very clearly that the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam and he slept. The woman was formed during the deep sleep, making her a participant in it. Were they ever roused from it? Scripture being specific, I don't believe so. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Immediately following the formation and presentation of the woman to Adam, we see the entrance of the serpent and Eve's temptation to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The tree of knowledge of good and evil is figurative of the old covenant and law of God. For Paul said, I would not have known sin except through the law. But knowledge of good and evil in the hands of pride produces accusation, death, and not life. Is there evidence of pride in the temptation story? There is. For despite God's declaration to Adam, the serpent tells Eve, you will not surely die and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. First, the tree of knowledge or law, followed by the tree of life or spiritual essence of the law. Love does no harm to its neighbor. Sleep is symbolic of death, and death, it is a necessary stage in the process of sowing and reaping. 
Just as a natural seed enters darkness when it falls into the ground, so too the resurrection of the dead is sown in corruption, dishonor, infirmity, and a soulish body to be raised or roused in a spiritual body. Everyone is in this process, for the principle of sowing and reaping is divine and universal, relevant to every soul. When we take time to really consider this principle, we come to understand that it reflects the essence of creation itself. For every time our Creator said or sowed, something was formed and raised. In part five, I suggested that Christ did not remove us from the penalty of sin, which is death. Why would he if death is a necessary stage in our journey to life? If this is true, then why did Christ, who knew no sin, become sin for us and, as the scapegoat, bear them into the wilderness? Allow me to share the following from Arthur Adams in his article, The Atonement as Typified in the Law. The atonement that Christ made is not a provision whereby man may escape the punishment of sin. God's punishments are always good and for the benefit of the one punished. And it would be doing the sinner an injury to shield him from those punishments, if such a thing were possible. The atonement is the means provided for man's deliverance from sin, not from its penalty. Christ came to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. God can remit the penalty in whole or in part, if he pleases without any sacrifice or substitute whatever. He has full pardoning power, like an earthly potentate. There is no such senseless rigidity to God's law that, like the laws of the Medes and Persians, he cannot control their execution and modify their effect if there is any need of it. As a matter of fact, however, there is never any need to change his law or to modify the penalty, because the law of the Lord is perfect and the chastenings of the Lord are good. No penalty is attached to any of God's laws that are not for the blessing of his creatures in the end. But God has made provision whereby man may reach a position where he can perfectly keep this perfect law, and hence, though the penalty will still be there, he will never become amenable to it, because he will never transgress the law. In keeping with Adam's remarks, I will close with the following. Whoever has been born of God does not sin, for his seed remains in him, and he cannot sin because he has been born of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such, there is no law.